Hello, everybody. I'm Phil Zio, and this is The Revolt of the Angels by Anatole France, Chapter 1, containing in a few lines the history of a French family from 1789 to the present day. Beneath the shadow of Saint-Sulpice, the ancient mansion of the Desparvieux family rears its austere three stories between a moss-grown forecourt and a garden hemmed in as the years have elapsed by ever loftier and more intrusive buildings, wherein, nevertheless, two tall chestnut trees still lift their withered heads. Here, from 1825 to 1857, dwelt the great man of the family, Alexandre Boussart d'Espelvieux, vice president of the Council of State under the government of July, member of the Academy of Moral and Political Sciences, and author of an essay on the civil and religious institutions of nations, in three octavo volumes, a work unfortunately left incomplete. This eminent theorist of a liberal monarchy left as heir to his name, his fortune, and his fame. Fulgence Adolphe Boussart d'Esparvieux, senator under the Second Empire, who added largely to his patrimony by buying land over which the Avenue de la Imperatrice was destined ultimately to pass, and who made a remarkable speech in favor of the temporal power of the popes. Fulgence had three sons. The eldest, Mach Alexander, entering the army, made a splendid career for himself. He was a good speaker. The second, Gaetan, showing no particular aptitude for anything, lived mostly in the country where he hunted, bred horses, and devoted himself to music and painting. The third son, René, destined from his childhood for the law, resigned his deputyship to avoid complicity in the fairy decrees against the religious orders. And later, perceiving the revival under the presidency of Monsieur Foyers of the days of Decius and Diocletian put his knowledge and zeal at the service of the persecuted church. From the Concordat of 1801 down to the closing years of the Second Empire, all the Despoilvieux attended mass for the sake of example. Though skeptics in their inmost hearts, they looked upon religion as an instrument of government. Marc and René were the first of their race to show any sign of sincere devotion. The general, when still a colonel, had dedicated his regiment to the sacred heart, and he practiced his faith with a fervor remarkable even in a soldier. Though we all know that piety, daughter of heaven, has marked out the hearts of the generals of the Third Republic as her chosen dwelling place on earth. Faith has its vicissitudes. Under the old order, the masses were believers, not so the aristocracy or the educated middle class. Under the First Empire, the army from top to bottom was entirely irreligious. Today, the masses believe nothing. The middle classes wish to believe and succeed at times, as did Marc and René Desparvieux. Their brother Gaetan, on the contrary, the country gentleman, failed to attain to faith. He was an agnostic, a term commonly employed by the modish to avoid the odious one of free thinker, and he openly declared himself an agnostic, contrary to the admirable custom which deems it better to withhold the avowal. In the century in which we live, there are so many modes of belief and of unbelief that future historians will have difficulty in finding their way about. But are we any more successful in disentangling the condition of religious beliefs in the time of Symmachus or of Ambrose? A fervent Christian, René d'Espelvieux, was deeply attached to the liberal ideas his ancestors had transmitted to him as sacred heritage. Compelled to oppose a Jacobin, an anti-theistical republic, he still called himself Republican. And it was in the name of liberty that he demanded the independence and sovereignty of the church. During the long debates on the separation and the quarrels over the inventories, the synods of the bishops and the assemblies of the faithful were held in his house. While the most authoritatively accredited leaders of the Catholic party, prelates, 
generals, senators, deputies, journalists were met together in the big green drawing room and every soul present turned towards Rome with a tender submission or enforced obedience. While Monsieur d'Esparvieux, his elbow on the marble chimney piece, opposed civil law to canon law and protested eloquently against the spoliation of the Church of France, two faces of other days, immobile and speechless, looked down on the modern crowd. On the right of the fireplace, painted by David, was Romain Boussart, a working farmer at Esparvieux in shirt sleeves and drill trousers, with a rough and ready air, not untouched with cunning. He had good reason to smile. The worthy man laid the foundation of the family fortunes when he bought church lands. On the left, painted by Gerard in full dress, Bedizened with orders was the peasant's son, Baron Emile Boussart d'Esparvieux, prefect under the empire, keeper of the great seal under Charles X, who died in 1837, church warden of his parish, with couplets from La Pucelle on his lips. René d'Esparvieux married in 1888 Marie-Antoinette Coupel, daughter of Baron Coupel. Ironmaster at Blainville, Hauteloy, Madame René d'Esparvieux had been president since 1903 of the Society of Christian Mothers. These perfect spouses, having married off their eldest daughter in 1908, had three children still at home, a girl and two boys. Léon, the younger, aged seven, had a room next to his mother and his sister, Bertha. Maurice, the elder, lived in a little pavilion comprising two rooms at the bottom of the garden. The young man thus gained a freedom which enabled him to endure family life. He was rather good-looking, smart, without too much pretense, and the faint smile which merely raised one corner of his mouth did not lack charm. At 25, Maurice possessed the wisdom of Ecclesiastes, Doubting whether a man hath any profit of all his labor, which he taketh under the sun, he never put himself out about anything. From his earliest childhood, this young hopeful's sole concern with work had been considering how he might best avoid it, and it was through his remaining ignorant of the teaching of the École d'Edouard that he became a doctor of law and a barrister at the Court of Appeal. He neither pleaded nor practiced. He had no knowledge and no desire to acquire any, wherein he conformed to his genius, whose engaging fragility he forbore to overload, his instinct fortunately telling him that it was better to understand little than to misunderstand a lot. As Monsieur L'Abbé Bartui expressed it, Maurice had received from heaven the benefits of a Christian education. From his childhood, piety was shown to him in the example of his home. And when on leaving college, he was entered at the École des Dois. He found the lore of the doctors, the virtues of the confessors, and the constancy of the nursing mothers of the church assembled around the paternal hearth. Admitted to social and political life at the time of the great persecution of the Church of France, Maurice did not fail to attend every manifestation of youthful Catholicism. He lent a hand with his parish barricades at the time of the inventories, and with his companions, he unharnessed the archbishop's horses when he was driven out from his palace. He showed on all these occasions a modified zeal. One never saw him in the front ranks of the heroic band, exciting soldiers to a glorious disobedience or flinging mud and curses at the agents of law, he did his duty, nothing more. And if he distinguished himself on the occasion of the great pilgrimage of 1911, among the stretcher bearers at Lourdes, we have reason to fear it was but to please Madame de la Verdelière, who admired men of muscle, Abbe Patoui a friend of the family and deeply versed in the knowledge of souls, knew that Maurice had only moderate aspirations to martyrdom. He reproached him with his lukewarmness and pulled his ear, calling him a bad lot. Anyway, Maurice remained a believer. 
Amid the distractions of youth, his faith remained intact. Since he left it severely alone, he had never examined a single tenet, nor had he inquired a whit more closely into the ideas of morality current in the grade of society to which he belonged. He took them just as they came. Thus, in every situation that arose, he cut an eminently respectable figure, which he would have assuredly failed to do had he been given to meditating on the foundations of morality. He was irritable and hot-tempered and possessed of a sense of honor, which he was at great pains to cultivate. He was neither vain nor ambitious. Like the majority of Frenchmen, he disliked parting with his money. Women would never have obtained anything from him had they not known the way to make him give. He believed he despised them. The truth was, he adored them. He indulged his appetite so naturally that he never suspected that he had any. What people did not know, himself least of all, though the gleam that occasionally shone in his fine light brown eyes might have furnished the hint, was that he had a warm heart and was capable of friendship. For the rest, he was, in the ordinary intercourse of life, no very brilliant specimen. This concludes chapter one of The Revolt of the Angels by Anatole France.